sorry, everybody. Uh, so we'll get going. I'm totally discombobulated now. Uh, my name is Sharice Lakeside. Um, I am known in CSI as the Kraken. Uh, my inner child's name is Peaches. So sit back because we're going to go for a ride on a really dry topic that hopefully we can make a little bit of fun. Um, I am the senior spec writer at RDH Building Science and have 30 plus years in the industry. I was two when I started, um, mostly in architecture, but also I've worked in construction, uh, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, engineering, and now in building science, which gives me a really unique lens because I've had the opportunity to work this business for multiple sides of the fence. Um, I'm really involved with CSI, which is the Construction Specifications Institute, which is about more than specs. It's also about project delivery, and we're going to talk about that a little bit today. You can read all, I'm not going to read all of this stuff. I do a bunch of, uh, I do a bunch of stuff in CSI. Um, but a couple of things that I feel are more notable and that I'm more passionate about is I teach the CDT, which is the Construction Document Technology um, class for the certification starts August 12th in Portland CSI and I'm hoping some of you are interested in that by the end of this class. Um, I do a lot of speaking and I'm also a mentor and one of my passions in the industry is young professional development. I have a whole bunch of hashtags so if you're looking for me you can find me on Twitter or on LinkedIn. I love to connect with the people I meet at these different events. So please send me a connection request. Drop me a note that we connected through the hackathon. Um, there's enough of these spam connection requests now that if I don't know who you are, I'm likely to den deny it. But anyway, welcome and thank you for having me. So um, we'll just get right down to business. I'm sure a lot of you are sitting here thinking, I don't even know why I need to be here. Um, you don't write specs, maybe you're not involved with contract documents, so you, maybe you're thinking this doesn't apply to you. Um, and it's actually the opposite, and it's kind of one of the travesties of our industry that we'll talk about in a minute. But every single thing that you do on a project is governed by your contract, um, your contract documents, which are your drawings and your specs and some other, some other documents, and the project delivery method. So, so whether you're working on drawings or you're creating technology that we're going to use or you're doing construction administration, if you don't understand these pieces, if you don't understand project delivery and your documents and their, um, the legal weight that they carry, then you're likely making mistakes right out of the chute. And so that's what I want, and wasting a lot of time. And that's what I wanna hopefully help you help prevent from happening. You can't effectively work in this industry if you don't have this education, and guess what? Nobody is getting this education. So what are we going to learn today? You're going to learn that you have a lot to learn. Um, you're going to learn that the things we talk about today are just the tiniest tip of the iceberg, and there's so much more involved, but I'm hoping that by talking to you today, you're going to go, oh, wow, I need to go look into this more, and I need to go find out more, and I'm going to tell you how to do that. Um, you're going to realize that learning this now, um, especially for those of you, of you that are on the younger end of the spectrum, which I know um, plenty at this hackathon are, that it'll be a game changer, not only in the work that you do every day, but um, also in your career. I'm really lucky to be a part of Generation X for the sole fact that we are a tiny generation. All of the baby boomers are leaving. They're leaving in droves right now, um, and our industry is changing faster and faster every day. But there aren't enough of me to, to fill their shoes. There's just no, especially in our in industry, because we've lost so many due to two recessions. And so I don't have any competition. I'm like the golden goose. I'm sitting here going, okay, this is, this is real. I've worked really hard my whole career, and now this is just, this is a cakewalk. Um, it's different for those of you that are millennials or Gen Zs. There's 75 million millennials, 75 million Gen Zs. You guys have so much competition, it's not even funny. Those of you that are smart enough to pick up the pieces of things, 
probably nobody's going to tell you you need to set yourself apart are the ones that are going to step up and work next to me, which I'm really excited about, by the way, um, 10 to 20 years sooner than you ever, ever historically would have done so before in this, in this industry. And so I'm hoping to help you do that. Things you are not allowed to say during this presentation. I already got my hand slapped for saying something I wasn't supposed to say. Thank you, Damon. Um, so now I'm going to tell you the same thing. We have always done it this way. Or we have never done it this way. Um, thank you to Nicole for uh, bringing me this one on Twitter. I'm an old dog that doesn't want to learn new tricks. If we have some people that are Gen X or boomers in this room, um, you don't get to say that. I don't expect to find a lot of that here at the Hackathon, but I find a lot of it elsewhere. Um, we'll, we'll just deal with that during construction. It's never going to change. I don't have time. These, all of these, if you want to see my head spin around on my neck, go ahead and say one of these things to me. Um, I don't believe in any of those statements, and I believe that we could all do better, and we could all understand more if we would just all talk to each other a little bit more. Suggested reading material. Um, it's the Project Delivery Practice Guide. It's put out by CSI. It is basically um, information on project delivery from cradle to grave. From the time an owner says, hey, I want a building, to the time they tear that building down. Um, if it was up to me, everybody would have a copy of this on their desk. If it was really up to me, if I was queen of the world, here, I'll just put my crown on and be queen of the world for this presentation. If I was queen of the world, everybody would get that certification and take that class so we would all be speaking the same language. So a few facts. Nobody is getting this education in school. Um, your first education in the areas of project delivery or contract documents in, in risk, typically my first education came when I screwed up. And that's likely going to be how it comes for you because nobody's learning it in school. And the people that are teaching you in your firms, will, many of them never learned it the correct way in the first place. So I call it the cycle of abuse in our industry. I learned it the wrong way, and now I'm gonna mentor you and teach you the wrong way. Um, our consultants on our projects don't even see a full copy of the documents until the project's out on the street for bids, usually. Just knowing that should change the way that you deal with your projects. Um, Design firms don't have people trained in project delivery. There's, as, as more, in, it's the kind of thing that many of us got training in much later in our careers, the ones of us that did. And so a whole lot of that group right now is in the boomer generation and retiring. Um, which means that they're taking that knowledge with them, the ones that are trained. And right now in firms, I'm seeing it everywhere because of this huge generational shift the Gen X people that are stepping into the leadership roles are just throwing this stuff at younger people and saying, figure it out, because they don't have time because there's so few of them. They're trying to run firms and run projects and trying to get these projects out, and there's just not enough of us to mentor everybody, so they're just throwing it out there, and firms are doing what, whatever they're going to do, and there are so many problems, and construction is having more problems than ever, I think. And understanding these things from the time you start design to the time you end a project um, can change that game. And I will say, and I added this note, it's not when I normally talk about this presentation, but because I'm here, I will, that I have seen throughout my career, I'm afraid to tell you what I've seen technology do throughout my career, because then I'm not, you're not gonna believe I'm 32 anymore. Um, I have seen and used software um, in, in different applications that I sat there and thought, whoever created this, do they have any idea how I really work or what I need? I felt that way about the program I used to write specs 10 plus years ago when I started using it. There were some things that just did not work for the job that I do, but yet this is a spec writing program. Lucky for me, that particular company was, it is, continues to be because it's the only program I'll use very user friendly and I would call them up and say this doesn't work for me and they would fix it so there's actually some things in that program now 
that are a direct result of my feedback, which is great because it, it, it works now in a way that I need it to work. But you have to understand that no matter what you're doing. I don't care what your job is in this industry. If you don't understand how a project comes down the pipe and how we have to communicate and who's allowed to do what contractually, then you're gonna create things that don't work. So where are we learning? We're not, that's why I'm here. The first thing that you need to understand is one of the biggest causes of conflicts on projects and problems and time wasting is inadequate and poorly coordinated documents. The drawings and the specifications are the contract and I, it blows my mind every day how many people don't understand that. They think the owner architect agreement or the owner or contractor agreement is the contract and it is, but it says in that contract that the drawings and the specs are also a part of the contract. So when you're working on a drawing, or if you are a person who is working in specs, those are both contract documents. You can't just put whatever you want in those, as nice as that would be. Um, your contract documents are the instructions to the general contractor only. One of the things I see over and over again is manufacturer specs especially, are some of the worst for this. Giving instructions in their specs for different people on the job site. The subcontractor's gonna do this, and the installer's gonna do this, and you can't do that. It's, it's not contractually not allowed in, in our industry. The design professionals cannot dictate means and methods to the contractor. <coughs> Excuse me. And, so there, there's all these things that people say in their documents, whether it's on their drawings or their specs, that don't even need to be said. It is the instructions to the contractor. The specifications are supposed to show what we call the qualitative requirements, the products, all the accessories for the products, the finishes, all the information about the products, the installation requirements, and any administrative requirements that are specific to that area of work. Um, the drawings are supposed to show the quantitative requirements and the spatial relationships and how many of what goes where. More often than not, you see information that belongs in the specs repeated on the drawings, which is a disaster waiting to happen because the minute somebody ch changes the drawing, and even and if, you're, if you're lucky enough to even have a spec writer, because that's fine, like finding a needle in the haystack these days, you invariably, especially at deadline time when everything's going hot and heavy, you forget to tell your spec writer and now you say one thing on the drawings and one in the specs. There's a reason that you say it once and say it in the right place. So that the con number one, the contractor is forced to read all their documents. If they have just enough information on the drawings to think they know what you need, they're not gonna look at their specs and they're gonna make a mistake and then you're gonna have a change order. Um, those are all bad things. So if you put the right information in the right place, they have to read everything and you only say it once so you eliminate that risk of duplications or leaving something out. Back in, and I'm only gonna stop on this for a second, but back in 19, I think it was 73, it's on there somewhere, yeah, 1973, the AIA did um, a list of the top five areas of risk for a design practice, failure to supervised inexperienced employees. Big issue right now with the huge generational shift. Um, inadequate project coordination, in-house coordination, failure to communicate between the prime and the consultants. Lack of quality control and poorly worded contract documents. Fast forward to 2020. We have the top, same top five areas of risk. What does that tell you? I know none of you can answer me because you're all muted, so I'll tell you what it tells you. It tells you that we're not changing. We're not getting better. We're not improving the way that we do things. Um, and and I, don't, I don't care whether you're talking about actually physically hand drawing or doing it, you know, doing your drawings in Revit or whatever. We have not changed because we still have the same problems, which means we have to change our processes. We have to look at this and make changes. The more educated we get everybody, because for whatever reason, they don't think they need to teach this to anybody in college, um, the more we can actually start that change. Because this should have happened. I should not be talking about the same problems 30 years later 
that I was talking about when I started my career. Contractors protected by the Spear and Doctrine, decided by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1918, that basically says the contractor has a right to get documents that are sufficient for what they're meant to be used for. And they're not responsible for a design professional's mistakes, which means they're off the hook if we don't do it right, yet we don't do it right. Um, I would say a majority of the time. There's no such thing as a perfect project, but we don't even come close on most projects that I see. The contract is, um, first thing to understand is what's called the tripartite relationship. That means the, the short version is the architect has a contract with the owner, the contractor has a contract with the owner. The architect and the contractor do not have a contract with each other, but they have third party obligations with each other, which means that their contracts with the owner say they're gonna do things for each other, even though they don't have a binding contract between them, which creates a, a pretty in, interesting environment sometimes on a job because architects says in their documents, in their specs or in their drawings, we want the contractor to do all these things and the contractor's over here going, I don't have a contract with you and I don't wanna do all of those things. So understanding that contractual relationship and understanding where to look in your documents to make sure everybody is following the same rules and speaking the same language is really important. Um, we're not gonna go into these at all, except for telling you that there are multiple different project delivery methods. And each one has a different um, contractual makeup and different balance of risk and different um, roles and responsibilities for different people. Um, whether you're developing some new great amazing thing or, or whether you're working um, on the model or, or whatever you're doing in the industry, you need to understand these different project delivery types, what the project you're working on is, and, and how you need to do things in relationship to that. There is no one size fits all in this industry and no two projects are ever the same. You know, I've, I've had people say, oh, just, just take that same spec and use it on, on this project. That's physically impossible. Every building is different. It's like, it's like a human being. It's like saying this human being is going to be exactly like this human being. Not going to happen. Um, your drawings and specs are, in the eyes of the law, complementary, which means they carry equal weight. So next time somebody so, says the specs take precedence or the drawings take precedence, that's not necessarily true. The contract may have a precedence statement that says one carries more weight than the other, and that will work fine on your day-to-day -day things going on in the job. But if you end up in court and in a lawsuit, what's going to happen is the, the, the judge and jury are going to go by what's reasonably inferred by the documents as a whole. The general conditions on a project says they are complementary. They will be considered as equals. So ignoring one and putting all your attention in the other is another mistake that many of us make. Um, and I already says, I said all of those things. Boy, I'm ahead of myself. Um, say it once and say it in the right place. We already said that. Forces the contractor to read the documents. Areas that... I'm not going to read these. I put all of this stuff on these slides so you have it to refer back to later. I'm just going to pick out a couple key areas. There are a ton of different areas in every project, administratively and technically, that need to be coordinated. The, the next couple of slides are just a few of those. But there's knowing that these things even exist in your specs will change the way that you work. Things like submittal procedures, that one's a huge one. I don't know if I know of a bigger area of conflict and time wasted than submittals during construction. It's actually outlined in your specs exactly how that's supposed to go down. What you're supposed to look at, what you're not. Um, sometimes a sub will give the contractor a big pile of submittals and the contractor just passes it on to the architect. We get it on the architectural side and we're going through all this crap we didn't even ask for. There's rules for that. And if you know that, you can send it back to the contractor and say right here in this section is how you need to do this and I'm not gonna accept it until you do. And save that time waste of going through all of these things. 
things like um, substitutions, both during the bid period and during construction. Those are usually two different sets of rules. Do you know those exist? Do you know how to handle that on your project? Um, QA and QC procedures are a big one. There's a whole ton of areas you need to coordinate. One of my favorites is access panels. It seems like, I don't care how long we've been doing this, we cannot seem to get access panels right. It's an architect's job to specify access panels. But MEP often needs access. I learned this when I went to the other side of the fence and, and learned I was doing things wrong with my consultants the whole time once I went to work for a consultant. MEP ne needs access panels. They know the architect's supposed to specify them. Architect doesn't coordinate with MEP, so they leave MEPs out or MEP's been burned before, so they put them in and the architect puts them in. And now we have two, which one did the contractor bid? Um, there are a ton of different requirements like that. And if if you start looking at your consultant specs and reading your consultant specs and documents, you will find things that they're repeating that are on the design side, the architect's side, in responsibility to specify. So they're creating conflicts in because a lot of most um, architectural firms don't even bother to read their consultant specs. They don't spot those and then it ends up being an area of conflict during construction. That is the worst time to deal with a problem. That's why you don't get to say to me, I'll deal with that during construction. You want to lose money? Say, I'll deal with that during construction. Things like closeout procedures and how substantial completion on your project is going to be handled. All of that is in your specs. But if you don't read your specs, um, or if, God forbid, you're being asked to work on specs and never had any, any training, in, in contract documents, all of this stuff will at least make you dangerous enough to ask the right questions and maybe head off a big problem at the pass. Common problems and conflicts are things like duplications, more than one discipline saying the same thing in two different ways, completely leaving things out. I've seen projects where both the architect and the MEP left those access panels out. And there's no access panels on the job. Big change order. Um, Lack of Division I knowledge, that's red because I cannot tell you how many times. I've been teaching for eight years, the CDT, and I can't tell you how many times I've had somebody sit down in one of my classes, hundreds of people, and say, what's Division I? Those are the rules of the road for your project. You need to be reading your documents so you know what to expect. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the owner's role on a project. You need to understand that so that the, the owner doesn't start dictating things. They're not contractually allowed to dictate on your project or on your design. Um, just basic terminology, things you can and can't say on documents, things you should and should not say on drawings. Um, what's going to happen if you don't get this knowledge? You're going to make mistakes and usually those are going to morph into the monster that is problems during CA, excessive RFIs and change orders. I know anybody who's worked in um, during the CA phase has seen that happen. And construction budget overruns, which, which can be a big problem. If things get really bad, you may end up in mediation or in court. You might lose your client. Um, I always tell people, you know, when, when I, I'm working on specs and I'm working with somebody and I say, hey, we need to get this covered, and they, they say those evil words, I don't have time right now. I'll deal with it later. I'll deal with it during construction. I will tell you right now that it will take you 10 times as much time to deal with that problem during construction than that half an hour you need to take to deal with it now. Find the time. Um, because if you're going to lose money on a job, it's going to be during the CA phase every single time because it's usually the smallest part of a design contract. Most design contracts are front loaded and you get a little bit for construction over a very long period of time. So you want to just get those things covered. There are different kinds of specs. We're not going to go into the details of these either. We'll be here for a week. But there are different ways to write a spec and how you coordinate what you draw with the different kinds of specs matters as well. There's things like performance specs that are not written around a specific product, but just completely written about around how something performs. Um, there's reference standard specs where it's written around a standard, an ASTM or, or something like that. 
just knowing that there's different kinds and all of these different kinds can be used in one book. You don't, when you're writing a spec, if, if one, one section can be a performance spec, one can be a descriptive, one can be a reference standard, you write specs in a way to fit what you're trying to accomplish. Knowing the basics of all of these will really help you in getting to where you need to go if you're working in just and I'm not saying, I, I want to qualify this right now. I'm not saying anybody needs to run out and become a spec writer. You can do really a, something like the CDT and be dangerous enough to protect yourself in most situations. You don't have to go and do these this years of training. If you want to become a spec writer, they're sorely re needed right now. So they're, it's a hot commodity if you're interested in that. Uh, your specs are organized using what's called CSI's master format. It's the numbering system. When you see that six digit number on a spec section, this is where it comes from. Um, funny thing, those numbers actually mean something. They're not just, I, I've seen somebody in a design firm trying to write a spec and just slap some, some number on it that looks good to them. They're organized those, the numbering system is, is organized to keep all of the same type of work together. It's organized by work results. So you can't just slap any number you want on a spec section and call it good. There's different groups and subgroups and divisions so that, for instance, division three is in the facility construction subgroup. So that's basically all the architectural sections. And division three is gonna be all the stuff to do with concrete. Division eight is gonna be all the stuff to do with openings, windows, doors things like that. Those numbers that are assigned to those sections are so all of that type of work is in one place and when that job goes out to the contractor and the subs and they break it apart and give it to different subs, the subs can be fairly assured that the work they need to look at for their specialty is all in one area so they don't miss it in the bids because that's a bad thing. Those numbers as they get bigger in the second and third two sets of digits means the scope of the work gets more narrow. You watch this go from irrigation down to underground sprinklers. So when you see those last two sets of numbers getting bigger, you know it's a narrower scope of a, a section. All of this, there's obviously a lot more to teach you, but they gave me an hour. Um, your specs are going to have it, all kinds of administrative requirements. And so, so what you need to know, let's, We'll use an example that you're working in construction administration and you've got a problem on the job and you want to go look up what, what, are, what are the rules of the road for my job in relationship to this problem. If you think you only have one place to look, you're already dead in the water because administrative requirements are going to show up in three, potentially four different places. These days it should be three, except for some real old school stuff. So the first one's gonna be your general conditions. These are typically industry standard printed documents. Um, for instance, the AIA puts out the A201, general conditions of the contract for construction. Um, that's one of the most widely used. They're broadly, um, broadly written administrative requirements that can be slapped onto any job and have been vetted by the courts. Those are usually modified somewhat for every individual job. In, in the old days, they called that a supplementary conditions, but now obviously with new, new technology, they just modify it and it's, it's a track change copy. If you, you have to change some things, it, like some states don't allow arbitration as a method of dealing with a problem on a project, but the general conditions has an arbitration clause. So you would cross that out. But then there's division one. Division one in your specs is the rules of the road for this project, this, this project you're working on. So you have your general conditions, it's broad requirements that you can put on any job. Division one are the rules of the road for this project. It's gonna cover things like submittals and project meetings and project closeout and project cleanup and what kind of job shack contractor has to have, all of those kinds of things. But then you have part one of your individual spec section which would be, and keeping in mind, Division One applies to the entire project. So they're broad to your project, this specific project. Then part one of your spec section is going to be administrative requirements 
that are special and particular to that spec section's area of work. So to hopefully make that a little bit easier to understand, a real quick example, that's just a diagram that you can look at later. Your general conditions has some very broad warranty requirements. Contractor's gonna provide warranties is basically what this paragraph says, but it doesn't give specifics of those warranties. Down here you see an underline, this is the track change copy, what it would have been called the supplementary conditions in the old days, that they added a little language to that. That's broad, it applies to the whole project, but it's not specific enough. Like, okay, they're gonna provide warranties, but how long do these warranties need to be for? Division one is gonna give you more specific requirements about the warranties, but this still applies to every single thing on the job. So it might say every warranty on this job needs to be at least two years and have some other requirements, but it can still, it still applies broadly to the project. Then you're going to have part one of your spec section. In the, this case, it's, um, I used a roofing section as an example. And this says provide a 25 year, I can't see it, 25 year wraparound warranty on the roofing system. You're not going to repeat what division one says and say provide to your warranty, this is only gonna be for part, in part one of a spec section, it's gonna be specific just to that section, and that will be considered in addition to whatever was required in division one for the whole project. So if you've got a problem on a job and you're trying to figure out how you have to deal with it, you potentially have to look in three different places to get your contractual answer. And I'm not even going into the fact that things like change orders, and some other things are um, also contract documents and you may have to look there as well. So you, you didn't know you were getting an anatomy lesson today, did you? Spec sections have three parts. Um, they use six digit numbers. They could be even a eight digit number, a point in two numbers after that, if it's a really narrow scope. Um, the three parts of every spec section should be general products and execution. Those act actual words. There's actually um, a format called section format that will outline exactly what is how a spec section is supposed to be laid out and what belongs in each part of it. We're just going to touch on a little bit of that today. Part one is the administrative requirements that are specific to that section. I probably can't say that enough times. Division one governs the whole project, so we're not going to repeat that stuff, but you have special requirements. Things like what work is included in this section? What submittals are required? Now, Division I says you're going to provide a PDF of submittal of the product data on everything in this job. So this section would not need to say provide a PDF of the product data. But maybe one of your submittals is you want samples of that carpet, Let's say carpet. Then you would put that here because it's not going to say that in Division I because you don't want samples on it on everything. You're going to be building another building just out of samples. So everything is specific to this section. Any coordination or meeting requirements, reference standards that have to be met. One thing that I think is kind of fun is testing. Um, testing could belong in part one, part two, or part three of a spec section, depending on where, when, why, and how it's, it's happening. So quality assurance or and or any testing prior to construction would be in part one. Warranty, additional warranty requirements beyond the division one requirements would be in part one. Part two is gonna be anything to do with the product, the accessories, the type of product, the finishes, um, any testing that has to happen at the factory or during manufacture, there's the testing that could appear in part two. The reason it's important to understand this is because testing can be a very expensive item. And if you have it in the wrong part of the specs and the contractor misses it, back to the Spearing Doctrine. Contractor's not on the hook for your mistakes, so then your owner has a huge change order that may affect the budget you thought you had for the project. Um, how you're dealing with non-conforming products, uh, manufacturer services with the products might all be in part two. Part three is going to be all of the execution requirements. And the reason this is called execution and not installation is because it's more than just installation requirements. The installation requirements are going to be there. There's going to also be site quality control, any testing that has to happen 
during construction, um, cleaning requirements, any closeout activities, protecting any protection and maintenance of the products on the site is going to be a part of that. And again, non-conforming work in manufacturer services during construction. That all belongs in part three. Every single day, um, especially in manufacturer specs, if there's new manufacturers online, I'm sorry, but the truth is the truth. Um, I get specs with things in the wrong place. If you go and just cut and paste that into your specs, you might be creating a problem that you just by nature of having never having anybody told you this, you don't even know you're creating until it becomes an issue later. Just as a quick aside, um, one of the things I should have put on that, what you don't get to say today slide is one thing that I hear often is, oh, it's just a little job. We don't have to mess with all of that. I don't need a full spec or I don't need a full set of documents or we'll just put some spec language on the drawings and call it good because it's just a little job. So I won't tell you the whole story, but I will tell you the biggest payout I have ever seen a firm that I work for, and it's not the one I work for now, um, pay out of pocket after their insurance paid, their errors and omissions insurance paid was a million dollars. And um, go ahead and put some guesses in the chat box of what you thought the fee on that project was that this firm had to pay a million dollars out of pocket after insurance covered damages to its limits. And I'll tell you at the end um, of this session what the fee on that job was and why it's just a little job, I don't have to worry about it, um, is something that you should never subscribe to. The language in spec should be clear. The four C's of CSI, I added the fifth one because I don't follow the rules. Clear, concise, correct, and complete. And I added coordinated because that is a piece where we, we fall down all the time. At, at my last office, and I'm starting it at this office now, I worked with um, all of our drafters and sat down and we worked out a system so that we were all using the same language. The language they were using on their drawings was completely different when we started than what I was using in the specs. I was like, how does the contractor even know what the hell they're looking for or, or what's right? Um, you know, there's, I call it construction slang using a short term for something like jib. Well, I've got five types of jib board in my spec and we've got the term jib on the drawings. So which jib is the contractor putting in that spot? Those kinds of things are big coordination issues on a project. If I don't, oh, I'm not doing too bad on time. Um, writing style. You, you'll all be happy to know I took 30 slides out of this today. So you don't... <laughs> This, this torture is not going to go on for too long. Um, sentences should be simple. You should use the imperative mood where the verb defines the action when you're writing contract documents. If you see the word shall all over the place, that's the passive voice. We don't use that in, you shouldn't use that in specifications. Every once in a blue moon, you got to use the word. Um, but I call shall the F-bomb of spec writing. I, I can't stand the word because you have to make a sentence twice as long to use it. And if you write in the imperative mood, um, you can make a really short, concise sentence and communicate everything you need to say. Um, you don't want, engineers are really bad. Engineers on the line, I'm sorry. You don't want really long, complicated sentences where if somebody makes a typo, leaves out a comma, all of a sudden what you thought you said in that sentence now means something else. Another reason to keep it short and sweet and simple. Um, you need to use words that are clearly understood. I, I often will see somebody write this big, long technical term, and I'm sitting there going, I don't even know what that is. I have to look it up, um, where there is a commonly used term that would make it more clear. We capitalize a bunch of things in contract documents, both in drawings and specs, and that's because they are proper nouns defined in the contract. And so they should be capitalized in the contract documents. You can streamline your language using modifiers or a colon. I love the colon. Colon is my best friend. Pipe, colon, install. I just told you in two words to install all the pipe. It's really beautiful. 
it, it's like it's like a challenge for me. How short can I make a sentence and still make it understood? Abbreviations. Those are fine on drawings. They're not okay in specifications. We spell things out. Again, there's a lot of different ways that people look at our documents on the job site. And two inches is not hard. I mean, that's easy to understand, but two with a little inch mark on a dirty set of drawings and maybe somebody just installed two feet of something. You know, you want to hope, hope that's not going to happen, but there's a reason we spell these things out to be clear. And these are just a few examples here of how it should be written in specifications. Things you should never say in your documents. As indicated, I love that one because I have seen that in specs and draw, and especially on drawings all over the place. And I'm going to show you something in a few more slides to outline exactly why you don't want to use terms like that. But that is, that is a red flag. That is a red, red flag that somebody was in a hurry. They just said, you know, do this as indicated because they're pretty sure it's indicated somewhere else or as indicated in the specifications, but they don't say exactly where. But they don't go check to make sure it's actually indicated there. I've actually seen change orders large ones paid out from using that terminology. It is a red flag that you're being lazy and not coordinating your documents. If you just don't let yourself use those terms, then you're not likely to make that mistake. Language like here in before and here with, we're not writing the Bible, we're trying to get a building up. So that should be avoided. Words like all, that one, I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've deleted the word all, thousands of times, thousands. You don't need to say install all pipe. If you say install pipe, it is assumed contractually that that means all the pipe. Um, there's all these extra words people like to use in a workmanlike manner. What does that mean? What I think is a workmanlike manner and what you think is a workmanlike manner is two different things. And it's subjective, so you don't want any subjective language. This is one of my favorites and I'm probably gonna make somebody mad, but to the satisfaction of the architect. Every time somebody sees that, they laugh, and it's like, the architect's never satisfied. I'm never gonna win here. Uh, again, it's subjective language. Uh, you wanna minimize or avoid using pronouns, words like which also. It's just all unnecessary language. Some more vocabulary things that that you should know, and, and this applies to drawings as well as specs. You use the word amount when you're talking about money, but you use the word quantity when you're talking about things like measurements or volumes, things like that. Um, the word either implies a choice, but both is all inclusive. <laughs> flammable and inflammable mean the same thing. You'd be surprised how many people don't know that. But the, 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 the red is the big one because this is a mistake. You know, a lot of times what I see is people put install whatever install air conditioning units. Okay, all you've told the contractor to do is to put in the air, air conditioning unit. You have not told them to buy an air conditioning unit. Um, if you say furnish an air conditioning unit, all you've told them to do is buy an air conditioning unit. Now it's sitting there with nobody to install it. The contractually correct words provide. That, that's commonly accepted as that means to furnish and install that air conditioning unit. So just get in the habit of using the word provide and then you don't have to worry about it. Sometimes you should use furnish or install because sometimes the owner provides a piece of equipment where you only want the contractor to install that. Means and methods, we brought this up for a minute before. Um, the design professional's contract with the owner states and the general condition states that the design professional has absolutely zero control or responsibility for means and methods during construction. What that means is when the contractor signs that contract, it's their show. Design professional will come out and observe. They observe. They don't inspect except at final completion. They observe the work for just general conformance with the contract documents, but it is the contractor's job to build it, decide who's going to do what, whether they're going to so perform some work or use subs for the work. Design professional has no control over that. So you never want to say anything on your drawings or in your specs telling the contractor what to do. You can tell them what you want, 
you can tell them that your enclosure layers all need to be in this order, but you cannot tell them how to do that work. And it can be shades of gray sometimes and, and difficult to define that, but knowing that you can't dictate that will keep you out of trouble. Because if you do dictate it and they do it your way and it fails, guess who just took the risk on? Not the contractor, you did, because you told them to do it and you're not supposed to do that. You don't, a couple that were almost done, huh? A um, couple things you don't do in your contract documents. You don't dictate safety requirements on the job site. Again, that falls under the contractor's risk umbrella. So you wanna make sure that doesn't happen. You don't put documents in your specifications that were not your responsibility to prepare under your contract. Those, is, those are gonna be things like uh, geotech reports, hazardous materials reports, um, things that are, were prepared by, for this project. The contractor needs to see them, but they were prepared by somebody else for the owner. People will tell you, I, I see it happen all the time. They'll, they'll come up to you and say, just put this in the specs. It doesn't belong there and you are taking on risk if you put it in there because you're putting it under your stamp. And your stamp says, I am responsible for everything under the stamp. So you never want to put in anything that's not included in your scope of work in your contract with the owner. Um, your division zero and one in general conditions needs to be coordinated and read and revised on every single project. There is no blanket document that you can buy and just slap it on a project and have it fit your project without modifications to fit what's going on in that project and that scope of work. And if anybody tells you there is, you're wrong, come call me, we'll talk. Um, and you should be coordinating your draw, drawing language with the specs, not vice versa. Um, the name of everything is always the same in the specs. And if you, I, I'm not a super good tech person, so go ahead and smack me down for getting this wrong. But if, if you build Revit families, make sure that the language you're using to define these things matches what the, the specifications say. So there's this lovely little book. It's called The Contractor's Guide to Change Orders. And going back, I'm not going to go back to it, but going back for a minute to that slide where I said you don't want to say things like as indicated, um, even if you're going to point to exactly where it's indicated, because then that, that spot could change and that's a different area of risk. This book is about, I think it's about 275 pages, is a step-by-step -step guide on how to find your mistakes in your, in your drawings and in your specs. And write down the things like there is a whole section on the word as indicated in this book, but there's a whole bunch of other ones. If you see this, it means they're doing this. Here's how to follow the rabbit hole down to get more change orders on that project. Now we would like to believe that every contractor is amazing and good to work with and reasonable, and a lot of them are, but there are also a lot that are not. And so knowing these things exist and getting your documents right just right out of the chute, instead of pushing things down the road, um, gives you a much better opportunity of not having to deal with things like that. Because this is an evil book. There is a whole paragraph in here, I can't remember the page, but um, it, the paragraph is titled Catch, Catch 22. And it is an entire paragraph advising the contractor on how to act stupid until the design professional just gets so incredibly frustrated that they just give up and give you your way. And it reads just like that. That's usually the first paragraph I show people in my class. This is a scary book. And knowing that people are being guided to your mistakes should, care, should scare anybody. Cost of a change on a project. You, you kick the can down the road, that change is harder to make and it costs, once a contract is signed, that, that graph just goes straight up. It costs 10 times as much making that change late in the game as it does early on and it takes 10 times as much time. So a few tips. Educate yourself and your staff. There is absolutely no excuse for not having project delivery and contract document education, except for the fact that nobody is telling you you need it. They're not telling you in school. When you get to your firm, depending on who's in your firm that might or might not have this, you may, you might not, I've had people tell me 30 years in, I didn't even know that existed. 
It's craziness, absolute craziness. Um, you can get your CDT. There are pieces and parts of this education all over the place. The only place that I am aware of that you can get it cradle to grave. And when, when we're done, um, Catherine, our moderator, could probably even give a shout out since she was a student in my CDT class about a year and a half ago, a year ago, something like that. Um, CSI is the only place I know of that you can get it all in one place. I happen to teach it. Other chapters across the country teach it at different levels. There are two testing periods a year if you want to get certified. Even if you don't want to get certified, take the class and get the knowledge. If you don't want to take the class, then buy that book and at least read the book. I'm not, I, I don't, I've been teaching this for eight years. I teach it twice a year, 10 weeks of classes. Seriously, I do it because it's a passion area for me. I'm not paid to teach these classes. I don't work for CSI. I have a full-time job, but it's that important and that relevant and would change your game. And if I would listen to my boss when I was 24 and took it instead of ignoring him and taking it when I was 45, ah, oh shit, I just gave it away. I'm, okay, I'm not 32. Um, it would have been a game changer for me in my career because they're just, it brought so many things together. So however you get that education, get it. Because uh, trust me, you're gonna be sending me flowers and jewelry and thanking me later. Um, be proactive and push for more collaboration and better understanding and communication on your teams at work. There is nothing more beautiful than learning something and then being able to go to your boss in a very respectful and nice way and say, you got it all wrong, but here, let me show you. And fixing something for your firm that closes a risk gap, it, it, it really does. It, it makes a difference. You know, they might argue with you for a while because they're going to say, no, we've always done it this way. Until you, show, you can show them why that's dangerous. Find a mentor. But when you do, make sure it's one that's actually trained in project delivery. Most people, especially that have been around a long time, um, think they have it all figured out but if they never got that it's not that they're purposefully trying to mislead anybody but if they ever not never got that education in the first place they don't even know that they were taught wrong so if you get a mentor make sure you get one who knows what they're talking about if i was queen of the world and i've got my crown on so for this little moment in time i get to be queen of the world nobody would be allowed to work in this industry whether it's in architecture engineering construction product reps tech owners they would not be allowed to go near something in the built environment without having this base knowledge first so that's my i was just preaching that's my preaching my my motto is total world domination i think i made somebody spit out their coffee over that one the other day um and and i think that this group i was really excited when damon asked me to come be a mentor i'm a mentor by the way too um because I love what I've been watching. I've been trying to make it to a hackathon for a long time now. And this is the first time I've been able to do it. I love what you guys are doing. It's, I'm excited about it. I plan to stay involved until Damon kicks me out. Um, and so please reach out to me on the Slack channel. Um, I would love to chat with you. And I think that was my last slide. Collect, connect with me on Twitter, LinkedIn. Send me jokes. Catherine, tell yours. <laughs>